So just start off, could you please spend a few minutes to give a brief, you know, overview of your background, career, and the history of your firm, JC Flowers? Uh, sure. Uh, well, I, uh, <clears throat> I went to Harvard College, and my roommate at Harvard, his father was a partner at Goldman Sachs, and I got my first summer job through nepotism. Uh, he got me <laughs> in the door. I worked for two, I took it from there after that, um, and I worked for two summers while I was at Harvard and graduated early and went and started at, at Goldman as one of the first analysts. Uh, not the first, but one of the first. So I started full time in 1979 and uh, became a partner in 1988. I stayed there for 19 years. I left Goldman at the end of 1998. Um, and I learned a lot, a tremendous, extraordinary commercial organization. It's about that almost from the beginning, I specialized in financial services in the investment banking area. Um, that was when when firms like Goldman were first setting up specialist groups, and I spent most of my career, after the first couple of years, all specializing in financial institutions. By the time I left in 1998, I was the head of that group at Goldman. Um, but I uh, thought I had gone as far as I could go at Goldman, so I left in 1998 and set up my own company, JC Flowers & Co., specializing in private equity and financial institutions, and I've I've been doing that for 22 years. Our audience are students who, you know, are aspiring to work in the financial services industry. So perhaps could you share a bit on, you know, how the financial institutions group in an investment bank defer to, you know, private equity and, you know, was it an ultimate goal of yours to transition to the buy side and if so, why the buy side? Well, I mean, they're <clears throat> both, I think, noble endeavors. <laughs> uh, both good ways to, um, to be involved in business, um, I, you know, one, one commonality one commonality is is deal making. So investment banking is about making deals, and private equity is also about making deals. And I think one thing which I, you know, learned a lot about at Goldman is how to make deals, and I think that's, you know, one of one of my greatest skills at this point. On the other hand, of course, there are a lot of differences too. So investment banking is also all about clients and winning and keeping clients. And that whole sales and relationship aspect isn't really as present in private equity. Although on the other hand, in private equity, of course, once you buy the company, you have to run it, improve it, manage it, deal with problems, et cetera, which is a whole big arena, which really isn't present in investment banking. On moving on to that same topic, um, you know, your, your, how would you describe your firm's investing style and how has it changed over time since you first started it? I would describe it as value oriented. Uh, we're value-oriented investors, um, obviously with a deep heritage and knowledge of financial services. Um, uh, and I think, I think over time, uh, I would say, I'll, I'll mention two big things in financial services which have become clearer to me over time. One is interest rates. So um, a big, big factor, enormous macro factor affecting all the investments that we make are, are, the, are the level of interest rates. Um, and I, that wasn't, I think, quite as clear to me, um, you know, 20 years ago as it is today. And the second is, you know, the, the culture of the, of the company. I mean, this is, I mean, everybody talks about the, the, the culture of, of, of the company, but it really does make a big difference. It makes a big, big difference. Um, it can be the difference between the same company, same, in, or not same company, same industry, same everything, you know, better culture, you know, can make a big difference. Right. And, and on the same topic of investing, what, what do you look for in, you know, financial companies that you're investing in? And, you know, are there any red flags that you, you, you look out for when investing in this industry? And after investing as well, how do you add value to your portfolio companies? Well, here, here's what we're not looking for. Let me put it that way. <laughs> what we're not looking for on the way in is one thing is we don't want to compete with strategic buyers. So we, we can't compete. We don't want to try to compete. We don't want to compete. They should win. They do win, et cetera. So we're looking for situations where uh, the strategic buyers aren't the answer for one reason or another. Um, and there are often, there are many situations where that's true. Um, secondly, we're usually looking for um, companies that we can get at a good price and then improve. So that means you know, we're looking for situations where we have a unique angle, we have something unusual to offer, et cetera, where it's something as opposed to something, 
you know, where, where anybody could do it and lots of people are trying to do it, you know, so that's the second thing. Um, we're very actively involved in, in the companies that we invest in. And one of the things that we felt like we learned in the crisis in 2008 is we had examples where we controlled companies and examples where we are a minority, same kind of company maybe, and we did much better. In times of trouble, we did much better um, where we could control the company and move faster and so on. So, so one, of, one of our rules today is we, we want to either have a majority or we want to have a majority when combined with investors like ourselves. And on that topic on, you know, like adding value and you know, helping these companies grow after that, after, you know, investing in them. How does your firm have an edge and, you know, identifying opportunities to create this shareholder value over, you know, the current management team? Are there, you know, any commonalities and, you know, the background of these people that are good at recognizing these opportunities? One, let me give you an example where we think we know what we're doing and I think we add value is in consumer finance. So in this particular uh, business, consumer finance, let us define that in this case is not credit cards, unsecured personal loans. So not mortgages. Okay. So we've owned maybe 10 of these, Canada, America, Japan, Netherlands, England, all over the place, um, Korea. <clears throat> Seen this movie many times, credit scoring, marketing, collect everything. And so, you know, we'll see in company A, Romania, I forgot Romania, we've done it there too. We have company A, they do it this way. In company B, they do it that way. In company C, they're not doing this. And I think through that, both knowing what investments to make and helping the companies improve what they do, we really have a lot to offer. We really do. And we really know what we're doing in this business. And, and you know, uh, you know, different parts of the geographies are some are more sophisticated, some are less sophisticated, some are more fintechy, some are, you know, et cetera. So, so I, that's a good example, I think, where we can help add value. Follow up on that, you have carried out numerous deals over, you know, several decades. You mentioned uh, 20 plus years um, at JG Flowers and Co. Um, in your opinion, what separates these, you know, the successful deals from the unsuccessful ones? <laughs> The success, is, the definition of success is different at Goldman when it's getting the deal done than it is in private equity, which is, you know, when, when, when you sell it. Um, you, know, one, one, you know, one obvious point, but is, is, you know, Bear's making is the CEO, of course, casts a long shadow, makes a big difference. And one of the most important things, maybe the most important thing is who is the CEO. We go into deals sometimes backing the incumbent and sometimes we're right. Sometimes we go on the deal back in the company and we're wrong. You know, sometimes we bring in a new CEO from the beginning, but getting that right is um, critical. And for long-term success, what makes a successful deal, absolutely critical. And some of the mistakes we've made are not changing CEO <clears throat> fast enough when we knew there was a problem, but we didn't act, act as quickly as we should have. Speaking of views, um... I'm sure that many of the students would be really interested in your investment in Japan's Shinsei Bank after its collapse in the 1997 Asian financial right. crisis. Um, perhaps could you talk me through your thinking process at that point of time? You know, how do you come up with that idea? Were there you know, any obstacles faced because it was the first foreign investment into a Japanese bank? Yes, well, it was a, a really um, iconic experience for me um, and a lot of fun. So what happened was the following. <clears throat> um, I uh, ran the financial institutions group at Goldman, of course, and I had seen a lot of successful deals in America, for example, the savings and loan crisis, where investors took advantage of the crisis and had done very well. So at this point, America was fine, but this kind of trouble was happening in Japan. And so when I left, Goldman, I thought, well, where can I, where can I make some money? And then that looked like a good idea, you know, to do the same thing with a Japanese bank had been done with American bank. Um, although it wasn't a very common idea at the time. One way I think I was lucky is, well, was I lucky, but one way I was lucky is having left Goldman, I had time to work on this. Um, it was very, very, it took a year, you know, I went to Japan, you know, many, many times. It was, and I had the time, I had the time. Uh, uh, and so, you know, not everybody did have the time. Not everybody thought, well, 
you know, and so and so for, so it came together in a way where where I, I, I had the concept, I had the time, I'd seen it work other places, and and we just went to work on it. Well, like some of the obstacle phase obstacles phase because you know obviously it's the first time that someone went into you know investing in a Japanese bank. Sort of goes back to I mean the biggest obstacle then or maybe was there was a just a very unusual idea. I mean nobody thought. Everybody thought some other bank would buy this. Nobody thought a private equity would buy it. It was just it's a strange idea. So, so, and particularly strange in Japan. So, over, so what the Japanese authorities wanted, which is completely understandable, is they wanted another bank to buy it. And one of the points I made a few minutes ago is we try not to compete when there's a strategic buyer. But no, no strategic wanted to buy this. And the reason was, that there was a lot of problems that needed to be cleaned up. And so if you have a big bank and you buy another big bank and it's got problems, then you've got problems too, you know, it kind of like infects your own bank, if you see what I'm saying. Um, so for example, you take the non-performing loan ratio. Those non-performing loan ratio, those non-performing loans are going on your balance sheet if you buy it. And even if you have a plan and a deal and a way to clean them up, it still looks bad. So strategics really didn't want to buy it and we ended up being the only game in town. But it took a lot of convincing to, uh, <laughs> we had a lot of help from, from many people, both in Japan and America and other places to, to convince everyone that this made sense. Do you have, you know, your, your eyes set on the next Shinsei, if, you know, during this period of time? We've done, uh, that was a very good deal. We've done a few other good deals since, um, but it won't be exactly the same. It's kind of like, what's the next recession? You know, nobody would have predicted COVID is never exactly the same. I don't know what the next rate deal will be. It won't be exactly the same. Um, but, but you know, what, one of the characteristics of this, you had um, a seller, every, this is true of every government. It's often true of big companies where, you know, they just need to get it done. You know, they're not that price sensitive. They just, they just gotta get it done. Um, uh, and without that much competition. So you had good, those, those kind of dynamics were good. And also a seller that was able to protect us on the downside. One of the beauties of this Japanese deal was that, of course, we had the upside of the investment, but we had our downside protected because if we had any bad loans, we could put them back to the Japanese government. That was really the, the key to the, the heart of what made this a great deal. Now, moving on to the topic of hiring, perhaps could, could you share what does a 10 out of 10 hire look like to you? you know, what are their characteristics? And you know, do you have any common traits? One thing, you know, on average they have common, you know, everybody's the same. You can be successful in different ways. But, um, but uh, one thing that I think is underrated is being smart. <laughs> uh, so let's start with that. I think being smart is a big uh, one thing that we're looking for. Uh, second is uh, certainly hardworking. You know, uh, um, people that you know are, are, are passionate or dedicated or etc. Definitely are the kind of people we're looking for. Um, you know, third, it would be of course be nice to have uh, you know there are people different gradations of this, but a certain amount of emotional intelligence or charisma or something like that. You know, there's a reason why salesmen get paid the most money. Selling is a very important part of <laughs> a part of life. And uh, good salesmen are, are, are valuable. Um, in our company, we have, we have a team system. Um, so I, I've seen companies whose culture, is, of course, can be successful, but it's like eat what you kill. Well, that's not our system. Our system is we work together. So we're working for, looking for people who will fit into that kind of, that kind of culture. Um, and, and lastly, I, I guess I would say, Usually, usually we're looking for particular um, uh, skills. So, you know, it's, it's not just the athlete type thing. It's, it's what skills you actually have. You know, to give an example, if we um, want someone who can translate from Japanese into English and back fluently, it doesn't matter how smart you are if you don't know Japanese, you know, and English. So, you know, usually we're looking for specific knowledge and skill base of some kind. In a similar vein, you have worked with many great executives and management teams before. In your view, you know, what makes great executives and great management teams? Similarly, you know, are there any common characteristics among them? 
I think, you know, to share some of the things I've said, but one thing, to be a good CEO is a little bit different, I think, than being a successful, you know, member of our investment committee. One thing is you're leading a lot, usually leading a lot of people. So, um, therefore, the ability to, you know, connect with, lead successfully, you know, the whole leadership thing, obviously, very important talent for CEO, which I think is not necessarily required to be a good investor, for example. Um, uh, and the other thing I would say about a good CEO uh, is somebody who can, at the same time, same time, both see the big picture, where's the industry going, where's the company going, you know, in the next five, that kind of thing, and integrate that with the granular details and have a, you know, an impressive grasp of the granular details. You know, that you really need to be doing both things at once to really be a good CEO, I think. Do you think like this is something that you have have to have it innately or something that you can actually, you know, train over time? Oh, I think it's a, a bit of both. I, I think that, I, I, you know, <laughs> it's both. It's both. Uh, you know, you can, uh, you can be born, you know, with the talent to play tennis well, but you also got to practice, you know, and you can practice a lot, but you know, et cetera. So it's both. Uh, but, you know, I think they, the, the, you know, if you meet different successful CEOs that we back, they, they, they could be quite different people, different in their personality, and it's not all, all the same, but they need to lead people, they need to be pretty smart, and they need to understand the big picture, and they need to understand their business on a granular basis, I would say. Um, in June's Euro Money Conference, you highlighted that you know, the biggest issue facing the EU's banking sector is, as you mentioned earlier as well, you know, the negative interest rate, which has been sub-zero over the past seven years. Um, what factors or indicators do you look for for a potential reversal of this trend if you ever think that it will happen? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't know any better than anybody else um, what interest rates are going to do. Um, I was talking to somebody else about this problem, one of our investors a few days ago, who said the solution to this is patience. That's the solution. Um, you know, it's going to take, it's, it's, it's difficult to see. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't claim I see any reason why interest rates are going up much anytime soon. Um, um, but in the fullness of time, they will. Um, and, but while they are this low, it is difficult. It, it, is, it is a huge factor in the performance of um, balance sheet companies like banks and insurance companies, um, which is much more important than everything else going on. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is loan losses, for example, for banks as COVID unfolds are an important, an important thing how long COVID lasts, how much damage it does, and what that means in terms of loan loss, which by the way, so far has been minimal, I might say. But anyway, that is very important. But even more important, this is what I'm trying to say, even more important um, are low and negative interest rates. It's very, you know, it's, it's very challenging to make a reasonable return with interest rates that low if you're a bank or an insurance company. Moving on, you know, China has also been starting to open up its financial markets to the world. And looking at you know your firm's portfolio, you currently have one active investment in the greater China market. What is your view on the opening of financial markets in China? And you know, do you see any opportunities in China's shadow banking? Sort of like yes and no at the same time, which is I mean you you, you cannot but but you know <laughs> marvel at Ant and Tencent and you know what they've done there. You know, it's just you know <laughs> extraordinary. Um, but on the other hand, the ant IPO getting pulled is an illustration of both things at the same time. You have this incredible, you know, thing that is going to go down in business history, uh, ant. But on the other hand, uh, it shows it's not so easy over there all the time. So uh, we, we obviously recognize the importance, the size, the growth, et cetera, of the greater China market. And if we could find ways to participate in that, where, you know, we felt safe, if you will, we, we would like to do that. But it, 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 it's, or to put it another way, you know, I, I think it's, you know, a lot more, if you're an insider, if Chinese person in China, you know, I, I think being an outsider coming into China as another extra level of challenge, maybe that's the way to put it. But to go back in time, back to the 08 um, online financial crisis, has, has that, you know, change the way you invest in the industry? 
We, we felt like we learned a couple of things, several things from that. We, but, but by the way, let me just say it was a very difficult time in financial services, a difficult time for us. We lost money. It was some, <laughs> some, some, some very memorable experiences. So um, uh, uh, a good time to learn lessons. One I already mentioned, which is the minority majority um, point where um, we, we had some situations where we were a minority, where there was trouble, where the majority shareholders weren't thinking about things the way we would, and it led to bad results. So that's one, one lesson we took away. Second is the very, very prosaic, but correct lesson that banks and insurance companies should have better liquidity and more capital. And I think that's basically happened. So banks today, have much, much higher level of capital and much higher uh, reserves liquidity than they did before the crisis. And I think that's good for the system and good for us and so on. Um, third and last, we, in a number of cases, had weren't diversified enough. So we've increased the level of diversification within our own portfolio. We're more diversified today than we would have been in 2008. And that's another lesson we learned. Right. And you know, coming back to the present right now, the current crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, um, you know, you have been known for making, you know, smart investments during these times of crisis, like the global financial crisis, the Eurozone debt crisis. Right now, do you see, you know, where, where any of opportunities lie? And on the flip side as well, you know, are there any steps that you take to protect your portfolio during times like this? This, this crisis is in, our, in our industry has unfolded in, in very surprisingly. So in March and April, we, of course, like everybody, were very, very concerned about the effects of the crisis on the performance of our portfolio. But what has actually happened is that it's performed <laughs> very strongly. And the stock market, that's not us, but the stock market has been tremendous. So both the operating performance and the level of equities you know, have, have astounded me. I, I just would not expect either of those to happen. So what has that meant so far? It's meant so far that um, our existing investments have done very well, but the distressed opportunities we would have expected, there have been, been quite a few, there's been an increase in that, but not as much as I would have thought. And whether that, uh, whether that, whether we do see that depends on how long the crisis lasts and how much government support, um, you know, which, who, who wins that race, the government support or the crisis? Who wins that race? So far, the government support has been more than enough to, to backstop the economy. And obviously with a vaccine coming along, you know, we may be, you know, inside of the end of this next year. Um, so this is a long answer, but let me conclude. One thing we have done, we've just done two deals in this area. Um, is taking advantage of property and casualty insurance rates skyrocketing. So catastrophe like hurricane insurance, directors and officers, these rates have gone up dramatically and COVID has been a huge insured loss. And when you have a big loss like that, insurance rates go up. So we've made a couple of investments taking advantage of that and these rate cycles usually go on for several years. So we, we hope to, you know, that's one thing, whatever the stock market's doing, whether it's high or low, this is happening. Insurance rates are way up. So we're trying to take advantage of that. Right. And, you know, moving a bit closer to, to, to the UK, um, Brexit has been an ongoing topic for a couple of years now, you know, with a lot of uncertainty that it caused. Um, perhaps you could share your thoughts on how, you know, Brexit has impact that your investment strategy within Europe? So we have a, we have a couple of investments um, in Britain and they, 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 they date back a ways, by the way. They were like before COVID, some cases before Brexit. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't, I think Brexit plus COVID just isn't good for the British economy, you know? So I, I think that, um, so what I guess, what does that mean for us? I think for one thing is I think it could mean more distressed opportunities in the UK. That's one thing. Um, but I think I think Britain's. Let me let me just try to put it a little bit more articulate. I think 
Brexit plus COVID are going to mean trouble in the UK economy. What that's going to mean are more distressed opportunities for people like us. I think 10 years from now, it probably won't make much difference, but in the short run, it's going to be tough and there are going to be opportunities because of that. And obviously you have invested in different geographies all across the world. Um, I'm curious as to how, you know, besides the financial factor, how deeply do other factors such as, you know, culture, social affect your investment decisions? That is a good question. And um, uh, you, you mentioned one thing I would have said right off the bat, which is there really are um, cultural differences, um, which, are, which are striking. I mean, so, which are, you know, which permeate the whole economy, not just particular companies. Um, I think one of the most unusual, by the way, is Japan. So I find China and America closer to each other than Japan, you know, more different. But, you know, everywhere, um, you know, people want to make a good living. Companies are trying to make money. money. That, part, that part's all the same. You know, one, one, one issue also is the level of transparency or lack thereof, corruption or lack thereof is, is also a big factor on whether a particular geography can be successful for us or not. Another trend that we are, we are seeing is obviously the growing fintech sector. Um, perhaps you could share your thoughts on that. Right. And um, how is the increasing trend of the economy turning digital shape your, you know, your investment decisions? I think so fintech um, is a big topic with, without, without one, without a simple answer. I mean, that's the way to put it. Um, I think that in payments, for example, fintech has made a big difference. And, you, and, and, and we've talked about Ant and Tencent in China. I mean, those are like gargantuan, extraordinary successes, or you look at uh, PayPal or something like that. So in, in payments, um, they have and do, I think, make a big difference and represent a significant opportunity in many cases. I think in lending businesses, it's a lot less clear. In the insurance business, it's a lot less clear. So if you take consumer finance, for example, which I mentioned a little while ago, you know, consumer finance, there's an idea that you can use internet credit scoring to do a better job in consumer finance. And I think in some areas which are not both geographic or, or segments, which are, let's say like micro companies, I think internet credit scoring approach, FinTech approach can, can really make a difference. But I think for in a mature economy, for a, um, you know, just for kind of mainstream consumer lending, it doesn't really make much difference. And, um, or, and one, one of the things that we see that fintech, sometimes fintech companies don't recognize is not just credit scoring, you also have customer acquisition. And you have collections, you have to collect these things, you know, from before they go past due, first day past due, second day past due, you gotta be all over it. And this three things, underwriting, collections, customer acquisition, all have to work together. So, so we see a lot of, a lot of FinTech type things are only focused maybe on maybe on credit scoring, but not the other parts, and therefore aren't going to be successful in the end. Um, so we're, we're more dubious about pure FinTech in the lending area. I want to advise on, you know, for students, you have obviously witnessed the, you know, the actions in the conference rooms, you've been there for, you know, the <laughs> OIT financial crisis, and right now, the disruption of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, you know, I think a lot of students would be really interested to know what's your method of, you know, staying focused and, you know, rational during these turbulent times. I think it's obviously a strange world where you're operating mostly remotely. So that's, that's one thing. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 I think that's both got pluses and minuses. Saves a lot of time commuting, you know. <laughs> I think for um, younger people who are used to using technology the way I'm sure you are, you know, it's not, it's, it's, um, but I, I, maybe it is harder to stay focused if you're home all the time. And I think this miss, miss, missing socialization of being in an office makes it, makes it harder too. I don't know. What do you think? What do you think it's like in the 
in these times. I think it's about adjusting to the new normal, I guess, because, you know, it's right. been a year that COVID struck. And obviously, like, you know, you have to do many more things virtually. Um, but and I, I understand that, you know, being, you know, millennial is easier to, you know, navigate technology. <laughs> so so in, in a sense, you can kind of see the impact of tech being amplified and in, in all areas of right. our life. And I think that that's really interesting, not like the way we shop, the way we, you know, uh, home meetings, the way even like right now, uh, studying, like even lessons are conducted online. So I think that right. really accelerated the pace of technology in our lives. Yeah. You know, one thing, actually the biggest complaint I've heard, which doesn't affect me and probably doesn't affect you, um, is people with young children at, who are not in school. So maybe a lot of your fellow students don't have kids yet. You know, my kids have grown up and they don't live at home. And so, but uh, that actually is the most common difficulty I've heard from colleagues and others is that it's, it really is hard to focus with your six-year-old and your three-year-old running around, you know, and they're not, you know, et cetera. So, um, but I assume that will pass. I assume that will pass and we will end up in a world, of course, which has learned something from this crisis. There'll be still people going to the office, of course, still people traveling and meetings and so on, but there'll be more of this kind of thing too. Uh, trying to, to take advantage of the efficient and good part of this kind of operation. And I reckon like more people would also um, start living away from cities as well, since there's not much need to, you know, commute to office. Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, uh, having lived in New York for a long time, um, I remember after 9-11 wondering why anybody would live in the biggest terrorist target in the entire world. You know, why, why, is, it, why is anybody going to live? But the, New York did great. You know, and I, I, people like New York, but on the other hand, is this is this time different? What do you think? Is it different this time? I don't know. I've Maybe never, it is. <laughs> I don't know. I've never seen like um, you know such a. I think when when nine eleven, I was still pretty young, so I don't think I felt that much of an impact. Um, and I'm from Singapore, so um, it's it's uh, yeah. I don't think like there was much of an impact felt. Um, but then now I think this is something that's global. So. Um, Definitely, I think it will change the world, change the way we live, the, the way we study, the way we conduct our lives. And um, I think cities will still be important, but it's, I think it's more shifting to more of a hybrid, you know, model where you have sometimes, some days of the week, you come into um, the city for your meetings or for your classes. Then other times you are, if it's more convenient, you stay at home and do it virtually. Yeah, well, that's probably pro probably right. It's not not like big cities won't be there anymore. But on the other hand, it probably will. Right. You know, they'll they'll not as the, the suburban areas will have growth at the expense of big cities. You know, maybe a little bit more than they would. Yeah. You're right. Also, by the way, the type of city, you know, not to, not to get distracted on this, but you know, ones that really are dense and require. Um, in other words, I feel like in America, New, uh, New York is going to suffer more than, for example, Los Angeles or Miami because it's so dense, it's so dependent on mass transportation, et cetera, et cetera, that, it, that it, this has been a bigger shock in a place like New York than a place that relies on the car. I think a lot of students, you know, right now um, with, the, with the pandemic and, you know, um, just in general, graduating from, from a university, um, would like to know, like, if you could start your career again, you know, as a fresh graduate in 2020, what, what is there anything that you would do differently? Let me, let me try to put, rephrase that slowly and put it in, in my own words. Well, one, one thing is that um, I think in the beginning part of your career, I mean, you have smart, motivated, all that stuff already. Okay, that's right. So now, um, now it's important to really acquire specific skills that are going to be valuable to employers with that, you know, you become the biggest expert on something, biggest expert on something. Um, and that means <clears throat> to a certain extent, narrowing, you know, industry type of, you know, that kind of thing as you become more and more the person that really um, is one of the experts in particular. I think that's very important to develop skills, tangible, and a certain kind of thing. Then as you continue in your career, you know, you broaden out again and eventually maybe you're the CEO and then you're, you have a very broad job. But, but number two, I'm often asked, um, well, should I go with a big company or a small company when I'm starting out, that kind of thing? Um, 
you know, I think there's a lot to be said for, for big companies. You get a lot of training. They're diverse. You, you can move around within the company. Um, uh, you meet a lot of people. So, you know, if you were the good company, even if it's a big company, I think that's, that's, that's not a bad idea in terms of a way to start out and build your skills. You know, if you try, try, join a smaller company, it's, you know, maybe, maybe that works out because it's a fantastic thing and, you know, maybe, but you're really very dependent on probably a few people figuring it out correctly. You know, maybe the CEO or one or two people, it's much more idiosyncratic and much, much riskier. So I guess my point is if you go to a small company, pick it very carefully. Pick it very carefully. I was like, if, if you're not sure like, you know, which small company to go to, then it's better to go to a big one. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and then, then you, you get some experience, you get some training, et cetera. You're, you know, the biggest experts on widgets in Bulgaria or something like that. And when the widget in Bulgaria deal comes along, then you do it, you know, like that. That's the plan. Right, got it. And um, moving on to the topic of like investing itself, um, how would you define risk and how do you make sure you have good control of it? So different types of companies have different types of risks, of course. Um, and you know, take, take, take banks, you have credit risk, you have liquidity risk. You have technological risk. You have uh, one of the one of the biggest risks, regulatory risk. And so, part of how we both define risk and control risk is having had a lot of experience, having seen, you know, these kind of situations many times before. You know, we have a pretty good idea of what we should be looking for in terms of in terms of measuring those risks and seeing if they are they're acceptable. Um, I made a couple more, more points. One thing, price makes a difference. So you could have a company with trouble, but if they give it to you, that's not very risky. You know, if you pay a hundred billion dollars for it, maybe that's risky. So the price is part of how, how risky it is. Um, or take another example, you need to get your money back in a year, you know, and that part's sure. And then it's okay. So that maybe that's not so risky. Um, uh, and, and another another risk that I mentioned before, but I think it's very important, is diversification. So something could be a risk worth taking. If you have a hundred dollars, it's a fa let's put it this way: you have a five times chance of making. You know, let's just say you have a fifty percent chance of getting five times your money, fifty chance of losing it all. Okay. If you have a hundred dollars, doing that with one dollar is not a bad idea. Doing that with all hundred dollars is a bad idea. So the point I'm trying to illustrate is that the you know, riskier things could still make a lot of sense, but you have to think about how big they are in the total portfolio. What insurance is all about, of course, you know, if you insure for a hurricane, if you have a hurricane, you're gonna lose a lot of money, but the idea is to get that diversified the size correctly, you know, so you can withstand a few hurricanes. That's such a long career. There's definitely many ups and downs uh, you experience. Could you perhaps speak a bit on, you know, your thoughts on failure and how, you know, young people who are just starting out should approach it? I would say a couple things about that. One is um, you and myself have picked a field where you're going to have failure. This is not, nobody in business gets it right 100% of the time. That, you know, maybe, maybe in some fields you can get, but not in this one. So you're going you're gonna to have things that go wrong. Um, I, I, you know, secondly, obviously, um, you learn from failure. Um, and for example, 2008 and nine for us is a very difficult period, but we, we, we learned a lot from it. Um, so that's, um, you know, so in other words, obviously try to learn from it. Um, and number three is perseverance. You know, um, you gotta, you gotta be tenacious and keep at it even when you suffer failures, even when it's not clear how things are going to get better, et cetera. Yeah, uh, and eventually, often they do. Thank you for that advice. And, you know, on, on that same line of thought, um, what's the best advice that, you know, you have received and, you know, perhaps like the most important life lesson that you have learned? One is, of course, this is a marathon, not a sprint. That's one thing. It's sort of like the tenacity and what do you learn from failure? Um, 
uh, so be, be, you know, have a certain amount. I mean, I mean, of course, of course, motivated, you know, ambitious people like I, yourself, I'm sure, and people in your class, you know, you want to get there fast. And then, and that's right. You should try to do that, but also bear in mind that, um, you know, when you look, you know, a year or two this way or that might not make that much difference in the long run. Another thing is try to, this is, I think, also obvious, but try to find in the company, I guess, mentors, you know, people who you are trying to emulate, who say they did that, I can do that, and who are looking out for you and where you have an emotional connection, emotional bond, and that kind of thing. I guess my last piece of advice uh, is, you know, have a life outside of work where, you know, it's that, uh, worth living too. Moving on to like questions out of like, um, Finance, do you find any skills outside of finance that, you know, are particularly useful that, and you enjoy? <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, having, having, I'm not sure anything that is easily acquired. Uh, having a good sense of humor, I think, helps. You know, some people just aren't funny. They're just not funny. What can you do? They just don't make you laugh. You know, one, one, one technique I tried over the years, you get the stoniest people, see if you can get them to laugh. The most difficult people, see if you can get them to laugh. This is, this is the one sales technique I tried. Um, uh, and and sometimes people, I'm not sure this is exactly what you asked, but you, you know, what's the single most useful thing you studied or whatever? The answer to that is no, I know the answer to that. The answer to that is statistics and probability. That is, uh, you know, I studied math at Harvard. There's nothing I ever used from math in my business career ever. You, you know, it was far too advanced. But statistics and probability, this we use all the time. Any, you know, particular other investors or business people that, you know, you, why? I have an answer to that, which is but not not a not a creative answer, but maybe a little bit of explanation, which is Warren Buffett. Um, so I'll say a couple things about him. One is he's one of these titans that I have personally met quite a few times. So I've had a fair amount of personal interaction with him. Um, one thing is it is amazing to me how right this guy has been. I can think of quite a few anecdotes where I thought X, he thought Y, I thought Y is crazy, and he was right. This guy just, it is uncanny how right this guy is. Um, third, he is very lucid and clear. You know, you can read his stuff, you can study his stuff, you can understand his stuff, it makes sense, and it often has um, observations, you know, which, you know, he's just very clear, very rational, very disciplined. Um, you know, when somebody says, you know, XYZ is like the Warren Buffett of China or whatever, I think, you you know, no. This is like saying it's the Mozart of China. You know, this guy is like Mozart. So to say, I mean, you know, there's many talented people all over the place, but this is really a unique, a unique guy. I, you know, I could go on about this. I, I, I have profited much from studying what he says, not that I, you know, do what he does or I'm in his league or anything, but I've learned a lot from, 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 from him. You mentioned just now about, you know, some anecdotes that, you know, he said something and you thought something. Perhaps could you share a bit on that? Yeah, I'll give you one anecdote. There's this, uh, for example, there's this company, this is a long time ago, a company called CIT. It was a commercial finance company. And this was still around, by the way. It's now part of a, part of a bank. Anyway, um, and... It was financed through the wholesale markets. So it was a lender and it borrowed money from banks and securitizations, things like that. And we were talking about whether to, and this by this company was founded, I think in 1907. So been around for a hundred years, right? Everything fine. So uh, talking with him about whether to buy this. And he said, well, you know, this to me looks like a pretty good deal, I have to say. And he said, well, you know, I, it's wholesale funded. I want to sleep at night. I don't want to worry about whether people want to wholesale fund this thing. You know, I don't like that risk. And we're thinking, what are you talking about? Like, well, this is no problem. It's been doing this for a long time. And, uh, you know, in 2008, absolutely right. Absolutely right. He was completely right. It was, it was an interesting experience. So, I mean, and I've had a few of those with him where his rightness has been very striking to me. I don't think doing that's so easy, though. I never, you know, he and Shirley Munger say, oh, you know, it's just it's common sense. Anybody can do this. I'm not so sure about that. You know, and I think one of the things uh, he has that they have is an emotional makeup, an emotional coldness, actually, 
you know, which is not easy to do. I think it is not easy to divorce your emotions from what's going on um, in a way that I think he does and is part of his success. All right, thank you. And um, just to round up on the final question, um, perhaps you could share with you know our audience what are your favorite you know books that you really enjoy and if you could recommend one which one would you recommend oh i read everything um uh your fiction non-fiction you know all kinds of stuff uh how about one q84 have you read that japanese by uh murakami, murakami the japanese novelist fantastic fantastic book try that one um I was just reading The Long Goodbye by Raymond Chandler. You know those mystery stories? They're, they're, they're fantastic. Um, yeah, Shoe Dog was a great business book. I don't, I don't like business. Shoe Dog is a fantastic business book. Um, all kinds of stuff. Just rereading The Lord of the Rings. I read it a hundred times. Just rereading it right now. Awesome. All right. And and that's that's all from me. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for your time. Okay. Um, appreciate it um, thank you pleasure talking to you jesse thank you have a good wishing you all success in your career and 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 and, and all good luck to the london school of economics thank you so much have a great day take care thanks bye, bye.